I bet you love penguins, right? The same goes for koalas or puppies. But what about sharks? Well, my next guest loves sharks. She loves them so much, actually, that she works a lot with marine biologists. Even though she's a statistician, Vianney Leos Barajas is indeed a statistician, primarily working in the areas of statistical ecology, time series modeling, Bayesian inference, and spatial modeling of environmental data. Vianney did her PhD in statistics at Iowa State University and is now a postdoctoral researcher at North Carolina State University. In this episode, she'll tell us what she's working on that involves sharks, sheep, and other animals. Trying to model animal movements, Vianney often encounters the dreaded multimodal posteriors. She'll explain why this can be very tricky to estimate and why ecological data are particularly suited for hidden Markov models and spatial temporal models. Don't worry, Vianney will explain what these models are in the episode. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 14, recorded February 12, 2020. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the project, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.anvil.app. That's learnbayesstats.anvil.app. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Abazian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. Abazian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching... Vianelios Barajas, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for taking the time. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm always happy to talk about the intersection of statistics and marine biology. I think I have to be careful that this episode goes smoothly and that you're happy with it. Because if I understand correctly, you have easy access to lots of wild sharks, right? <laughs> I know some people who have access to sharks. <laughs> yeah, you have a sharks guy. That's not good for me. <laughs> Okay, so maybe you can start by your background. I understood you went into mathematics and statistics really early. So how come? And can you tell us the story behind that? Actually, when I went to undergrad, I thought I wanted to do business. Hmm. So not mathematics or statistics. And as part of the business course, you have to take an economics class. And I'm glad there are people who study economics, but it was definitely not for me, like at all. Yeah. But I had to take a calculus course and I loved it. So I was like, this calculus course is amazing. This is exactly what I like to do. I was having so much fun while everyone around me was just in pain and did not enjoy the course. So eventually I found my way <laughs> into math. After I kind of bounced around from business to different types of engineering, I realized that I just really liked math. So that's what I did my undergraduate degree in. I've always been very fascinated by, well, sharks as well. So I, I did my undergraduate degree in mathematics, but I would always tell my professors that I wanted to apply math or statistics to shark data of some sort. And I don't know why I've always been so fascinated with sharks and like marine biology, but I've always been good at math. And so I kind of knew that I could be the mathematician that worked with the chart biologist. So yeah, that was actually something that I've been wanting to do since I was an undergrad, taking theoretical math courses. Statistics gives you such an avenue to apply these methods. So I knew that that's what I wanted to do my PhD in, because as a statistician, you can collaborate with so many people. Yeah, it's very clear. That's funny to see this journey you had from uh, business and then economics and then going really into math and then to statistics to do some applied stuff. And <laughs> you figured out in the end quite easily and quite uh, quickly what you wanted to do with your life. And now, well, you're doing what you wanted to do. So you are uh, working with sharks a lot and with uh, marine biologists. So maybe first tell us why... Uh, uh, you find uh, sharks so fascinating and also how did that happen? How did you end up working with marine biologists on these types of projects? I can't really remember why I like sharks so much and I think <laughs> people have started asking me this question quite a bit because they're like well you're a statistician or people think I'm an ecologist or I'm a marine biologist and I'm like oh no I don't have any background in that at all. My background is very much like mathematics and statistics purely but I've always just found it fascinating like I would watch shows on shark, Natural Geographic and I would always see these animals move to different areas 
areas and you have the narrator telling you like, oh, well, the sharks went here because they're doing this and the sharks went here because they're doing something else. And so I always wonder like, well, how do you know? Like, how do people know this? You can't just be underwater all the time. So then I realized that they would attach sensors to these sharks and to these different animals and they collect the data. And then from that data, they have to make sense of what the animals are doing. I mean, I kind of figured out what I kind of wanted to do early on, but I also did my PhD in the middle of the US where there is no ocean. So <laughs> I was sort of surrounded by like cornfields and soy pigs. <laughs> yeah. um, I just kind of like kept repeating that this is what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to do while people gave me strange looks. And eventually I found a way to get connected with people that worked on animal movement and actually got connected through people in Scotland or not at my PhD institution. And from there, I just kept saying I wanted to do that and kept sort of volunteering my time to run analyses and write papers. And yeah, I just try to take advantage of every opportunity that comes across my way that involves sharks somehow. <laughs> That's fascinating. It's a lesson in uh, perseverance and passion. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats on that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I love it. So, and actually, did you already uh, go into the ocean uh, once or several times to observe uh, sharks? Can you even observe sharks? Because I heard some of them are dangerous. So, can you do like you would do for, I don't know, turtles or dolphins or else and like swim with them a little to observe them? Or is it always like through sensors and through technological instruments? The people that I collaborate with, you have to put the sensor on the animal. So you do have to be underwater with the animal or you have to capture them somehow. So the best thing, if anyone out there is a mathematician, a statistician, I would highly recommend getting in touch with your local shark biologists and collaborating with them. Because <laughs> I've been able to go on research trips to the Galapagos Islands to work with a biologist named Alex Hearn, who's part of the Miguel Mag Network. And he took me snorkeling with scalloped hammerheads and black tip reef sharks. Um, Ooh, nice. And I've also... I've also been invited to Baja California with an organization called Pelagios Cacunja. Biologists there, James Ketchum, and they took me snorkeling with whale sharks. That do sound uh, very nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's uh, interesting about what you do is that, yeah, as you say, there is this part about um, observation and going on field trips and field research. And also you work a lot on models. So I'm guessing that, uh, yeah, you're using computers to help you with these models. And yes. so I wonder if you have a favorite programming language each time you have to fire up a model to analyze your Galapagos sharks data. <laughs> So I primarily use R for everything. Mm -hmm. And of course, to do inference, I've gone down the Bayesian route and I'm using STAN for pretty much everything as well. So R and R STAN. And I think biology in general, they use a lot of R. It's good to be consistent as well ah, with yeah. what they use and what I use. That's interesting. I didn't know about the fact that uh, R was uh, used a lot in biology and that it was useful for you also to be on the same page uh, with the other researchers. And yes, yeah, so you use STAN. That's a really good tool, uh, state of the art. <laughs> And actually, do you remember how you first got uh, introduced to Bayesian methods? And maybe why do you still use them today? I can't remember exactly. I think like an undergrad, I did a project, but they're all based on doing maximum likelihood inference. Mm. And I started grad school as well. The PhDs here in the US for statistics, you basically start off taking coursework. You don't start off with a project right away. And so you kind of see like maximum likelihood, you see Bayesian methods. And what fascinated me about maximum likelihood inference is like sort of like all the different ways you can construct confidence intervals. Right, you have asymptotic normality, you can use bootstraps, you can use profile like and I thought it was really interesting because you could see how different sometimes those intervals were. And so I think the reason that I was really drawn to Bayesian methods is because it's always you just have a posterior distribution and that's it. It just seems so much easier and I like working with probabilities, like assigning probabilities to the different possibilities of that parameter. Exactly. And also, uh, each time you do a, a Bayesian analysis, you get uh, probabilities and compatibility intervals and certainty estimation for free. I mean, it's part of the workflow of the analysis. You can't go around it. Exactly. Mm. And I think sometimes it's a bit easy for people to focus on point estimates and maximum likelihood inference without taking into account all the uncertainty and the confidence intervals. But like you said, Bayesian methods, you can't get around that. And that's kind of really nice. It's forced upon you, but for good. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, and so you found that useful in your own research and that's why you decided to stick with it? Yeah, and so I guess once we talk about this a bit later, so the models that I work with, having these intervals from a Bayesian framework are much more useful, I think, than trying to construct maximum likelihood intervals. Oh yeah, clearly you're uh, preaching to the choir here. <laughs> but uh, as you said, we're going to dive into your projects later. But maybe you can paint us a picture I wonder what's the state of Bayesian statistics in marine biology. If you want to rephrase that, I would say uh, <laughs> how widespread or accepted are Bayesian methods in your field. So I always have to preface this by saying that I am in no way a marine biologist or an ecologist, but I do work with a lot of them. And I work a lot in Latin America, which is kind of like a big thing for me as well, because my family is all Mexican. I was born in Mexico, but raised here in the US. I really love you know, being able to not only get, do I get to do shark work, but I get to do shark work in Latin America, which is extremely powerful to me. So Bayesian methods, I think that people know about them, but they're not as widely accepted because sort of this maximum likelihood way of doing inference is the default. So I'm now sort of teaching some people about Bayesian methods. We're doing a lot of shark work in STEM. And so I'm trying to sort of pivot them more toward a Bayesian framework when needed. It's getting there, but I don't think it's as widespread as people might think it might be. Yeah, but you didn't have uh, any experience where uh, you wanted to do uh, an analysis uh, where you thought that uh, Bayesian methods would be useful, but you had a hard time convincing your uh, colleagues or co-workers or co-authors, etc.? Sometimes I'm the only statistician as part of these projects. Mm. And again, it's very much also like kinship doing research with other Latin American scientists. So we discuss, you know, different models and the different frameworks. And I try to explain exactly why I like doing things in a Bayesian framework mm. or inference really in a Bayesian framework. And so I create this dialogue with people to talk about why I like Bayesian methods, why I like quantifying uncertainty with probability. So it's less of me imposing Bayesian on them, but having that discussion of what we can do together. It's uh, inspiring. I guess uh, also for people uh, that do Bayesian uh, research and even for people in industry that uh, are working with uh, non-statistical uh, co-workers and need to explain to them uh, why they're using such method or this one or and not another one. I find from personal experience, it can be something uh, very important and sometimes frustrating. But uh, you're right, it's almost always an important part of any project. Doing things in a Bayesian framework, I think people see it as something that's very subjective, that has all these assumptions, or you, just, you, know, you select your prior distributions. But then I'm like, okay, well, great. Let's be have like an open and honest conversation then about all the assumptions that we make, even when we're yeah. doing maximum likelihood inference. Yeah, exactly. So I think people want to do things in a non-subjective way, but I like to talk to them about like, well, there really is no non-subjective way of doing things. And so once you have like an open dialogue about all the subjectivity that goes into every process of collecting the data, like the model selection, the analysis, you start to realize, okay, maybe the Bayesian statistics and the Bayesian framework, the subjectivity is sort of just all out there. <laughs> You're not hiding it, which I like. Yeah, I don't think there is any approach that's not subjective or there's no default way of doing things. So for me, then I just like, again, quantifying uncertainty with probability. That's a very nice way to put it, I think. That actually uh, reminds me of a passage I read in uh, Udaya Pearl's The Book of Why. He actually, because he's got uh, all this section uh, where he talks about how he came to Bayesian inference. He has a sentence, something like that. I'm paraphrasing, but from what I remember is something like, you can't really do causal inference without a model and you can't have a model without making assumptions. Oh. So it echoes what you talked about. And yeah, at least... <laughs> With the Bayesian frameworks, you have to put your priors out there and people can see them and they can change them. Also, if they don't like them, they can change them and see how the analysis uh, changes and how sensitive the analysis is to a change in priors. Yeah. So recently, sort of continuing on this deep dive of Bayesian statistics, what I think about it is that the model has parameters that require information, right? So the information can come from the data, or it can come from the priors, or yeah. it can come from both. So I've been going down this route of thinking about estimability and identifiability in statistical models. I like that the Bayesian framework allows me to say, well, maybe I don't have the information that I need to estimate this parameter just in my data, but I can now put some of it in my prior. Or maybe the information that I have in my data is a little biased, so mm. I can try to adjust for that somehow in my prior. So I really 
really think about it as doing inference for these statistical models and these parameters need information. And I like that Bayesian statistics allows me to incorporate that information in my prior as well as in my data. Oh yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. And here you're talking about, for instance, uh, when you have unidentifiable parameters in your model and then you can't fit your MCMC chains, for instance? Yeah, so models that I work with are typically mixture models. So you need enough information in each component of your mixture to be able to estimate it. And sometimes you just don't have that in the data for whatever reason. But I think about it just in general, the topics of like, how much data do I need to fit this model? So I think about it as well, not only data, but how much information do you need? You know, how much information can you get from different data sets of different sizes? And then how do you balance that out with the prior distribution? Actually, that's interesting. Let's uh, <laughs> talk a little about that because it's a very common problem to have unidentifiable parameters in your models. And so usually, as I said, one of the consequences is that your chains won't even sample correctly or won't converge. But the problem is that in this direction, it's easy to see that it's an unidentifiable. But most of the time, you just sample, you see that your chains are diverging or not converging. And then you have to diagnostic why. So how do you do that usually? How do you determine that you have a parameter in your model that's unidentifiable given the data you have at your disposal? I wish I had the answer <laughs> because that would make my life so much easier if I could just yeah, say, my, well... mine too. <laughs> could make so much of our lives so much easier if we could just say, well, we know exactly what happens yeah. when there's a non-identifiable parameter. So uh, I have to usually take it case by case. So I have to understand, and what I'm talking about is not like the constraints that you impose like on a simplex for identifiability. So it's not just like mathematically, asymptotically, something is identifiable, but I usually think about it in practice. Can mm -hmm. I estimate this parameter? So I mm -hmm. think about it more towards like, I would call estimability, although a lot of people still call that identifiability as well. So for me, it, it really has to be on the case by case basis. Hmm. When I see my posterior distribution doing very strange things, when I end up with extremely multimodal posterior distributions, I start to realize like, okay, something is off. I wish I could give you a great answer, but it's very <laughs> specific to like for myself implementing the same models over and over and over on different data sets and starting to build some sort of intuition of, okay, I have a multimodal posterior because there's a breakdown here. Oh yeah, but it's actually interesting. It means that usually you take several different data sets and you fit them with the same model and it gives you information on what could be wrong with the model? Yes, I guess it's just that all the different analyses that I do have usually centered on a common statistical framework. What's nice about it is that I can then learn about all the quirks of the models that I work with and all the problems that could arise. Does it mean that you have a lot of data <laughs> in marine <laughs> biology? Because for my end, I mean, I'm already happy when I have a, one data set to fit my model. So <laughs> does it mean you have so much data that you can uh, do that in marine biology? Oh my gosh. So in ecology in general, because the sensor technology has gotten so much better so quickly, batteries are lasting longer, you can store more information in these devices. You have just an enormous amount of information on animal movements. So yeah, I mean, I have like a list of projects that I could work on and so much data that I could work on as well. Oh. So yeah. Finding data sets and projects is not a problem for me. Sometimes they give you like a million data points and a tiger shark. Oh yeah, that's awesome. You should send some of the data my way because <laughs> I'm usually lacking data. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, definitely. Then we can talk about all the things that can go wrong when you're doing Bayesian inference for these models and non-identifiability. Exactly. Well, there is just a slight problem. It's that I don't know a lot yet on marine biology, but uh, I can read, no problem. <laughs> I think it's a good time to talk about what you're doing with these sharks. So what can you tell us about what you're working on with the sharks and other animals also? What's your focus? So I've been quite involved in the area of statistical ecology, which I don't think is as an area of statistics as I thought it would be. But so I've worked, like I said, a lot with researchers in Latin America, primarily with two groups, Miguel Amar, which sort of focus on uh, conservation for marine species on the Eastern Pacific. And then Pelagios Cacunja, which is based in La Paz, Mexico. And of course, I love 
working with them because I get to work both in Spanish and English and I get to go to Mexico more often, which is where <laughs> my family's from. So yeah, so shark work in general with these sensors, you want to know not only where are they going, but what are they doing while they're there, Yeah. right? So I get to be the statistician that implements typically with so these, I work a lot with hidden Markov models, which are a class of time series models. So the data that is usually collected is time series of shark movements. And so I have projects now, like I said before, in the Galapagos Islands, working with movements of scalloped hammerhead sharks. I have projects working on bull sharks for the residency pattern in Mexico. I have a tiger shark project that's part of my dissertation. Where I'm trying to look at their movement patterns at different temporal scales at the same mm. time. I'm working on a project of oceanic white tip sharks as well, looking at their daily activity patterns. I have projects. I'm on a committee for master students that's doing work with juvenile white sharks off the coast of California. And then I just have a few other projects that are sort of on my list. So yeah, I do a lot of work with sharks. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And actually, let's dive. Yeah, I know it's a bad pun, but I, <laughs> I, I had to do it. <laughs> let's dive into this shark data. We we're talking about the fact that often uh, you were working with a multimodal posteriors. So can you tell us if and why these data are more prone to yielding these multimodal posteriors? And why would that be a difficulty uh, when estimating your models? Hidden Markov models are a class of time series models where you have an observation process, like the data that you collect. What you observe is being driven by some underlying behavior. And I work specifically with finite state hidden Markov models. I suppose that maybe there are like five different behaviors that this animal is doing, and it's resulting in the data that I observe. Okay. Right? For instance, I think the reason that we have these multimodal posteriors can be for quite a few reasons. But one thing is that when you select the wrong number of components, which in HMMs, we really call them states. If you think that there may be five different behaviors or states in this hidden Markov model, and yeah. you try to fit that to the shark data, but really maybe there are only, there are actually supposed to be seven, right? So the parameters are then saying, well, maybe what you wanted was the, these five of the seven. And then another chain, it's like, well, actually, I think she wanted these five of the seven components mm. to be identified. So the model is trying to capture the seven different components with the five that you've specified. And each chain is going to give you a different combination of those. So what you end up with is marginal distributions that put some probability mass around a specific value. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, well, actually, maybe you were thinking it was this other value over here, right? So there's this misspecification. I think it's yeah. model misspecification in general in hidden Markov models. And generally, the class of finite mixture models can give you really multimodal posteriors. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think there's any way around it. Like with hidden Markov models, you're always going to try to fit a hidden Markov model to animal movement data that is misspecified in some way. Unless every time you can guess correctly, here are the exact numbers of states and here are okay. the underlying processes that I think are generating them. It's like, it's just sort of like fact of life when working with hidden Markov models. Yeah, okay. So if I understand correctly, you often have multimodal posteriors, but you don't want to have multimodal posteriors. <laughs> Ideally, you would like only unimodal posteriors for each of your states. Yes. The multimodal posteriors for the applications that I work on are usually not what I want. I usually want a unimodal posterior for each of the parameters that I'm estimating. Yeah, and the problem often come from the fact that a hidden Markov model is estimating a finite number of states. Well, as you said, if you parameterize your model with five and the reality is that there are seven, then you've got this problem of uh, multimodal posteriors. Yeah. And for hidden Markov models, you can say that maybe the latent state process that you don't observe that you're trying to estimate, maybe that's just like five normal distributions, yeah. right? So you have a mixture of five different normal distributions with some dependence over time. But that could also be maybe it was supposed to be five gamma distributions. There's a lot of ways that fitting a hidden Markov model can go wrong. So mm -hmm. I think that's the fun for me as a statistician is that I get to work with shark data, but fitting these models, specifying these models for animal movement data isn't always so clear. And there are a lot mm. of challenges along the way. Yeah, I guess. But actually, that yields two questions in my head. The first one is, if your problem is particularly the number of states, can't you do something like cross-validation? If you have a prior on the number of states, for instance, do you think that there are between two and 20 states in reality? Can't you do like cross-validation on this subset of states, which would be kind of like fitting a model for each of these different number of states and then choosing the one that doesn't yield conversions, problems, and multimodal posteriors? Yes, that's going to be something that people are going to continue to work on, I think, forever, is how do you select the numbers of states? I wish I had a great answer for that one. So say that, you know, the correct number of states 
the beha- underlying behaviors of these animals was like seven in seven different states. The challenge is that not only do you need to do maybe cross-validation to try to select the number of the states or put a prior on the number of states, is that when you specify two, three, four, six, ten states, your posteriors are going to be extremely multimodal. Mm. This is why I love Hamilton and Monte Carlo, is you need an algorithm that's going to efficiently explore your parameter space to try to uncover all the multimodality and different behaviors that's occurring. And if you overspecify the number of states, you can also run into problems of degeneracy. You're supposed to have seven, but you specified eight. So there can be a lot of computational issues that arise as well. So yes, I think there are a lot of different ways that you can try to select the numbers of states, but sort of the path to get there is a bit treacherous. Yeah. I'm sure that I'm totally wrong in asking uh, all those questions about how to select the number of states, but I try to understand why it's actually difficult to select this number of states. Kind of going back to the sharks in ecology, the reason that I love working with these models is that I think statisticians, we tend to like to impose like cross-validation or some technique that can tell us, you know, what's the number of states. But when you present this to ecologists, it's not just how many states are there. Are these states meaningful? So you kind of have to have this assumption of, well, first off, maybe a normal distribution is meaningful for the patterns that I want to capture, right? So maybe if I have two normal distributions, three normal distributions, four normal distributions, like that would provide something meaningful to me. And sort of conditional on our model specification being meaningful, then I think we can get into automatic selection of the numbers of states. But most of the times, they might not be meaningful. So it's kind of that, again, it's that dialogue between ecologists and statisticians of what modeling framework and model specification is meaningful for the data that we're working on? How do we incorporate biology and ecology into our model specification? And only from there, then do we want to get into sort of these automatic selections. Yeah, and that's where being in the Bayesian framework is really interesting for you too, because you can incorporate all the prior information and scientific knowledge you were talking about. Exactly. I can't really do my work without collaborating. Yeah, clearly. (laughs) That's very interesting to hear. You say that you use a lot this hidden mark of models and that a big difficulty, even after having thought hard about the scientific knowledge that informs this model, is selecting the number of states. So if I understood correctly, these models are interesting to you because they are a useful technique to identify the hidden states Mm -hmm. in your data, in reality, that you can see in your data because your data is, uh, your observations are limited in some ways. Yes. You know, if you have like a GPS track of a shark, Mm. all you have are the positions of the shark, but you don't have its underlying behavior, its movement patterns. So that's why I like to use hidden markup models. Yeah, because then, for instance, your reasoning will be, well, based on scientific knowledge, I think that the types of sharks we observe, I really don't know anything about that. (laughs) Just bear with me. The types of sharks we observe, we assume that they have six basic states Mm -hmm. and the data we have is there to help us identify the parameters that determine these six underlying states. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's very interesting. And so that's why you said you work a lot with time series data. I saw you work a lot with spatiotemporal models. So I was wondering, is it just another name for hidden Markov models or (laughs) are these a different type of model? Very different types of models. I tend to think of hidden Markov models I don't really care to make a big difference between like hidden Markov models and Markov switching processes. I think you just have this Markov switching component that's informative of what happens in a hidden Markov model Markov switching process. But these spatial temporal models, it can become a hidden Markov model. You're going to have Markov switching spatial processes, but that's not what I'm doing right now. Mm. So the spatial temporal work that I'm doing is actually something I've just been getting started with in my postdoc. Okay. And it's very different from sharks. Now we're working with disease data. So we're looking at the prevalence of non-tuberculous mycobacteria in Hawaii because it can cause this really highly infectious lung disease in humans that can be pretty serious to treat. So yeah, you have spatial data and that spatial data is collected over time. We want to take into account that observation is more likely to be like its neighbors, or like the observations that are close to it spatially. Yeah, okay. But that also has the temporal evolution. So in these cases, you have the two dimension, like the spatial dimension and the temporal dimension that you didn't have in your shark data and hidden Markov model. Yes, exactly. And so the goal, sorry, of the spatial temporal model is like the hidden Markov model to infer the underlying states of the situation you're studying? So not exactly. We don't really have sort of these latent patterns. 
What we just want to know is what is the spatial process like on the islands? Mm. And that just comes from the observed data directly. So there's nothing mm. latent about that. And then we just want to understand how that spatial pattern evolves over time. So slightly different, but it's something, just something new for me as well. Yeah, that's interesting too. But in these cases, you don't have the hidden layers that you have in the hidden Markov model. No, but actually this is something that I am eager to work on in the future. The reason that I decided to do this postdoc is because I would be much more involved in spatial statistics. Mm. And because I want to bring that, I want to combine the hidden Markov model work I've done with the spatial temporal work that I'm doing here to have Markov switching spatial processes for hopefully animal movement. So that's the dream in a few years. That's a nice dream. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then your goal would be to combine the hidden inference that you have with HMMs with the spatial temporal uh, dimension that you have with the spatial temporal models. Mm -hmm. That sounds really cool. I hope you're going to manage to work on that and do some amazing models. I'm really eager to see that. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I hope I get to do that as well. Yeah. We talked already a little about it, but you're using Stan to feed these models, but they sound uh, quite complicated. So <laughs> you said that you had often difficulties fitting and implementing them. So I'm wondering if the technology has caught up with the statistical theory in this domain. Are you kind of the only one on earth to be able to fit these kinds of models? Because you really know these models and you know how to code them and implement them and fit them. So it's kind of a limited use or is it quite easy to do that in Stan now? I would say I'm definitely not the only person doing this. Uh, there are some fantastic researchers in the area of statistical ecology that actually come from both sides of being statisticians who are very applied mm. and quantitative ecologists. There are some really, really amazing quantitative ecologists that are doing this type of work. So for me, it's great. I get to learn from them. I am quite a fan of Stan. I really love Hamilton and Monte Carlo in general. And that's what brought me to Stan. I think one of the issues with fitting these models is essentially you have a lot of data. I tend to work a lot with accelerometer data. And mm -hmm. so you have, you know, sometimes 20 observations per second, the data collected over a few days. I think there's a lot of statistical theory out there about how to fit these models in general, but it really needs to be adapted to what animals actually do. So I think that's the fun part for me. I get to try out different models and different modeling frameworks and how I think ecological information could be incorporated. And I get to use STAN. So I don't have to worry about fitting the model. And like I said before, these models are really hard to fit sometimes, or you just have very weird pathologies in the posterior. And I like that STAN will take care of that for me, or mm. will try and tell me that there are a lot of divergences. So then I start thinking about issues with estimability. So I think there's a lot of statistical theory out there. And now the issue is trying to make the most of combining statistical theory and ecological theory. So it means that people who are interested in uh, using these kinds of models, hidden Markov models, for mm -hmm. instance, or spatial temporal ones, they can do that instead quite easily. And they don't have to be statistical researchers well versed in the nitty gritty of the algorithm that you need to feed these models. Exactly. And actually, there's some work in progress right now to make HMMs even easier and faster and stand. So I'm quite excited about that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, I think I saw uh, last week that Michael Betancourt published an Orvix a paper where you are a co-author with him and Charles Margustian yes. about uh, exactly these hidden Markov models. Yes, I've known Michael now for a few years. And so I talk about hidden Markov models and sharks all the time. <laughs> uh, so I finally sort of dragged him into the hidden Markov model world. And he was able to work his math magic, him and Charles, to derive the gradient for the mm. marginal distribution of a hidden Markov model. So the next step now is Charles is working on implementing that efficiently into Stan. Okay, it's really happening. <laughs> yeah, it's happening. Like right now, it's happening. Yeah, right now, before our eyes. And yes. uh, <laughs> people have uh, heard about that in this podcast. That, uh, exactly. I'm, we're basically making history in this podcast. <laughs> yes, and it's an exclusive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thank you again for that. <laughs> Anytime. Um, that's great, honestly, uh, kidding aside, it's awesome. Of course, uh, I can't have any useful critique about uh, your paper with Michael and Charles uh, <laughs> because it's way above my league, but it's uh, really amazing to see this work and then to see that uh, this new way of computing gradients for uh, hidden Markov models is then implemented in Stan 
and then that all the people using this uh, probabilistic programming language can use that to their advantage and then fit hidden Markov models more easily and quite easily. That's awesome. So congrats yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And a question I like to ask my guests who are at the end of the show, like generally, because we already talked about some of your uh, concrete difficulties in your models and so on, but maybe what are the most common difficulties you encounter with your models and data and how do you usually solve them? So I think there's two aspects of that, is that there's the statistical difficulties that I encounter, mm -hmm. but I think in large part is that I really like doing interdisciplinary research. So I think the most difficult thing, first off, is that once you have a data set, mm -hmm. is trying to understand exactly what questions you want to ask. And because I, you know, I fit hidden Markov models, I fit hidden Markov models a lot to a wide variety of different animals. Actually, I should mention I've also worked with snakes and sheep. Oh, but, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, not sharks, but I tend to talk about sharks the most. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know. So. <laughs> it's interesting to know, too. <laughs> yeah, so baby snakes and field snakes and merino sheep in Argentina. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so people approach me and they want me to fit these models. But I think the hardest part is sitting down and trying to relate again that these models are not magic in any way, mm. but that these models have a very intuitive interpretation. You have mm. an observation process and these latent patterns can maybe identify different behaviors of the animals. Yeah. I think that's the biggest difficulty is trying to open that dialogue where I relate what I as a statistician and what these models can provide for them. Mm. But then also also having them really talk about how their domain expertise corresponds to what they want to do and why a hidden markup model is useful. So sort of mm. bridging those two disciplines. I think that's sometimes the hardest thing because I can give them a model, but if they don't quite understand why it's important, but they just see that, you know, you can publish with a hidden markup model and you can get into a good journal if you fit a hidden markup model, you know, you start to break down of like why it's actually useful and why it's important and why we can find out cool things about sharks. So for me, I just want to find out cool things about sharks. Yeah. So yeah, I think for me, that's the biggest thing. As a statistician, being able to relate why I do is important and useful for ecological environmental data. And then the other way around of having them tell me why my models are useful for them. Yeah, I agree. It's also a, a very important part to stay motivated throughout the process, because I remember when I talked with Michael Bettencourt for uh, episode six of this podcast, he was talking about the fact that doing science is really difficult for everyone and even for him, which was quite surprising to me. <laughs> He was talking about the fact that it's quite normal that, that you have difficulties doing what you do because uh, basically you're trying to answer a question that uh, nobody has answered yet. Mm -hmm. So there is no pre-formatted answer. So I really think that at least it's my personal experience, but that if you're passionate about the subject matter that you're studying, and as you said, in your case, it's finding out cool and interesting things about sharks, well, then you're going to be able to stay motivated when you have uh, difficulties fitting your models or your data not being uh, kind enough to you or so on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's always going to be problems when you start fitting models to data right away. Yeah. Um, but I think the most important thing is that it's not that you're starting off failing, but you're starting mm -hmm. off by learning, like learning through like multimodal posteriors. Now I start looking at the <laughs> different modes and trying to understand like, okay, what is the shark doing that I'm not capturing? Mm -hmm. Or what is the sheep doing that I'm not capturing? <laughs> you know, so it's just that first initial, like we're going to fail together and we're going to learn together. And that's going to lead us to be able to answer some cool ecological questions mm -hmm. together. <laughs> totally. I can tell you work with uh, Michael because he said basically the same thing. He said something like, if you don't fail, actually you don't learn. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael and I, we do work together on something, but knowing him over the years is actually because his father's Mexican. So for me, I grew up in the U.S., so I don't know a lot of other Mexican-American statisticians. <laughs> so Michael and I just talk about Mexican things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have our philosophies about how to do science that are compatible, but really we just talk about Mexican things and Mexican food. That sounds nice. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I should have invited you both during the same episode and we should do a special episode on uh, Mexican food. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my god, that would be fantastic. I mean, we are both Mexican-American, so yes, we could definitely talk some tacos. Oh, I'm getting hungry now. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to have to finish up the episode quite quickly. <laughs> Actually, what you said made me ask a question, which is, do sheep move 
as much as sharks, because in my mind, sheep stay where they are and they don't move a lot. But I'm sure I'm completely wrong because I just live in a big city, so I don't see sheep every day. <laughs> and in my mind, uh, sharks uh, move a lot. So what can you tell us about that? There's a lot of different species of sharks, right? And so there's only a, a limited amount of data that I've seen on each one. So I taught a workshop over the summer and there was a student there, Sarah Duongo, who's a PhD student at uh, mm. Florida International University. She was showing me this like great white shark mm. phenomena data. Mm. We just really realized that this is like a basic shark. It was not doing anything interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was not very active. It was not moving around a lot. It was like, what are you doing, shark? <laughs> it's completely <laughs> really more interesting. You know, sheep are interesting as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah, but this shark you're talking about, it was not a good hunter, I guess, because uh, <laughs> if you just stay there, I'm not sure he was eating a lot. Um, yeah, maybe he had just eaten, you know, so we have data for a few days and yeah, the shark yeah, wasn't maybe. doing very much. Maybe, but at <laughs> least it's quite easy to fit the hidden states of this shark. Oh yeah, one state. Yeah, <laughs> 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 it's uh, it's quite easy. <laughs> I have another question that popped into my mind when you said that you were doing some teaching. I wonder if you try to instill some particular skills into your students when they are in front of you. I've had the opportunity to do like many workshops or be part of like one instructor of a, of a larger workshop. And they're almost always geared toward ecology students. I'm usually one of like very few statisticians that are there. And this recent one, I actually started off the first hour by not talking about statistics at all, which was, I think, surprising for them <laughs> because I was the only statistician that was teaching. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm sure they're like, oh, she's a statistician. She's going to come in with all those fancy methods and <laughs> equations and Bayesian statistics. And we're going to solve the world with mathematics. But I actually spent the first hour not talking about statistics or math or any equations at all, because I think ecologists have this like incredible domain expertise and they have so many fascinating stories about their animals. And I feel like sometimes they then sort of abandon that and then think that they need to pick a right or a good statistical method that will answer all their questions for them. Mm -hmm. right? So they need to fit a fancy model. And so the first hour was actually not statistics at all, but it was just talking to them about how they can make the most use of their ecological expertise. Talk about the observation process being serving as kind of a proxy for these behaviors they want to identify in the animals, how that could work in accelerometer data, GPS data. And it wasn't until I had that foundation of why these models might be useful and why their ecological domain expertise matches with these models that I'm going to present did I then mm. get into actual equations and Bayesian inference and everything else. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, maybe different than people, what people expected. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure. You're right. It's interesting. It echoes what you said earlier about the importance of domain knowledge and scientific knowledge and how to really think hard about what you're trying to do. How do you translate that into your priors and how it relates to the data you have and that yeah. you're using to fit your model? Exactly. Okay. Well, our time is almost up. So let's talk about the future. I wonder what you are most excited about for the months to come. So quite a few things. I tend to be involved in quite a few things at the same time. First off, I'm really excited about going to Uruguay. In the beginning of October, there is a Latin R conference and it's going yeah. to be held in Montevideo. So for me, again, it's very important that I connect with the Latin American community. It's kind of like where I get to go and just be with people that are like me, speaking mm. Spanish as well. And it's, mm. it's always, I love it. So Latin R, if anyone is interested, <laughs> October 7th through 9th yeah. in Montevideo, Uruguay. So quite excited about that. Maybe just uh, give us the elevator pitch for the conference. Is it a conference uh, even? or? Yeah. Sorry, so yes, it's a conference for R users in Latin America. Okay. But it's actually English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So anyone is welcome. And it's just trying to motivate the R community in Latin America. Because usually okay. you have use R conference, but that's not typically held like in Argentina or Uruguay or Brazil or something. That sounds awesome. And actually, uh, it would be interesting to put the link in uh, the show notes of the episode. Yes, they're there. Perfect. So yeah, it's latin-r.com. So yeah, and then I've also started trying to get a Stan Ecology community page up and running. So where people in ecology that use Stan kind of have like a central location for all the ecological applications of people using Stan for Bayesian inference. And in part, this is because I've had so many people asking about how to use Stan for their models. And I know so many people are already doing that. So I just want to sort of all bring them together. Like let's yeah. just form one community, have a central location. And a few different things are kind of happening on that front that I can't talk about yet. And actually, Michael and I are going to work on another paper and Charles, sort of like a Bayesian workflow for hidden markup models in ecology. 
So that paper, I think, is from the academic that I'm definitely quite excited about. Yeah, that sounds great. I really want to read this paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I want to write the paper so badly already, but I have to do some yeah. other work first. Yeah, indeed. And you already do a lot of things, so... <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, what you said about uh, building the community and uh, helping people connect, I really relate to that and I find that very important. I remember when I started uh, learning Bayesian statistics, there were some very lonely moments. <laughs> exactly. Even still today, because as we say, uh, there are always very difficult moments when you're uh, working on a model. But when you have the community behind you to ask questions and help you give you some pointers or some resources, it's an invaluable help. Yeah, I really want it to be a place where people who are even just beginning in Bayesian inference can talk about, you know, like, well, I have this sheep data yeah. and I think I might want to fit this model. Like, how do I relate my domain expertise? Why is this model important? Mm -hmm. And then how do I select priors? Like, how do I relate my domain expertise into the priors that I select? Yeah. I think having a, a community page is going to be really great for everybody. Exactly. Just the fact of being able to ask that, it's very interesting because, well, then you can have someone that comes and answer and say, well, actually, maybe you should look more into that or something like that. And either you didn't think about that or you didn't even know that this method existed and it helps you a lot and it helps you save a lot of time and pain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Vianney. So I think we have uh, reached the end of the show, <laughs> but uh, I could talk for hours, uh, but I have to let you go at one point. <laughs> but before that, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So the first one is, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? So for me, I mean, I did my PhD because I wanted to become a statistician. I wanted to work with shark researchers and other ecologists, but I think the reason that I want to stay, for instance, in academia or stay like down the line of work is that I want to be able to spread the opportunities and resources to others that don't have it. So if I had unlimited resources, I would just try to spread them as much as I could all over the world. And it's why I'm so passionate about working with Latin America, is that there are not as many people who work in statistical ecology, but you have people with incredible data sets. I might be the only person they know that does Bayesian inference. And so I feel like, you know, I have that opportunity to share my knowledge. And I think to be cognizant of the fact that sometimes, you know, if conferences are always held in the US or Europe, mm. that means that only people that can go to these conferences are really taking advantage of like the networking, collaborative projects that come from that. So I would like to spread science and opportunities and resources to everyone in the world that wants to be able to do it. Awesome. Yeah, that's a very nice goal. I hope you'll be able to do that even without uh, unlimited time and resources. <laughs> And the second question is, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? So I have a hard time with that question. Again, I don't really think I have one person that I would say, like, I grew up thinking, oh, I want to follow their path. And I think it kind of relates to the question you just asked, is that for me, as someone who's Mexican-American, Mexican-American woman, I don't have that many people that I can think of as role models. You know, but I do think of all the people that could have been, could have had been like great scientists or were great scientists that we don't celebrate now. I don't know who I would want to have dinner with, but I hope that who we think of as a great scientific mind, that picture in our head changes over time. Yeah, very interesting. Well, Vianney, it was a pleasure talking with you. I find your work uh, fascinating, honestly. It's great to see Bayesian tools such as STAN being used in applied marine biology. And I'm sure you inspired our listeners. And I hope we gave people an overview of how useful hidden Markov models are for modeling sequential data, if I understood correctly. Personally, I, I really want to try them out. Yeah, it's also all the work you do about spreading uh, scientific knowledge and know-how in Latin America and ecological research in general is very interesting. So thank you for that. As always, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. So thank you again, Vianney, for taking the time and being on this show. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. This has been another episode of Learning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher and visit learnbayesstats.anvil.app for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true Bayesian state of mind. That's learnbayesstats.anvil.app.
Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman, fit MC Lars and Mega Ram. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. Thanks so much for listening. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.